My name is Jake Ward, and I just wanted to welcome you all here to West London Alliance Church this morning. We're so uh, glad to have you here with us. Uh, if you're new to us this morning, I just want to direct you towards our connection card. You'll find these um, on the seat in front of you. This is a great way for you to get connected with us, to learn about the ministries that we have here, and for us to connect with you uh, through that. You'll also uh, be able to connect with us through the weekly bulletin that goes out. You'll see that Behind me, there's a QR code. If you want to get on that list, it's helpful to find up, out what's coming up next. You can scan it right now, or you can visit the church website at uh, wlachurch.org and get signed up there as well. A couple announcements uh, today. After the second service, uh, we have Soup Sunday. So uh, you can join us for a bowl of soup. This is a thing we've done for a couple months now. Great way to connect meet members here. Um, second announcement is uh, movie event coming up. So, March 12th, uh, we have a uh, film that we're watching called Revival, The Work of God. That'll be at uh, 6 o'clock here in the sanctuary. And what it does is it, it first defines the biblical definition of revival and then looks at a couple of examples over the last uh, couple hundred years in the UK as well as here in North America. Sunday School uh, here at West London, we have new series starting up March 19th. Uh, it's a four-part series, and it's looking at uh, wisdom literature in the Bible. So the first, uh, the first session will be, will be taught um, by Andrew Hall from Community Bible Chapel. So if you want to get signed up, um, it's a four-part series. He'll be doing, working his way through Proverbs, and then it'll be followed by, uh, by Psalms, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Psalms. So just to go over again, that's March 19th. That'll be 6 p.m., okay? Our annual general meeting is coming up, so mark that in your calendars. You don't want to miss that. It'll be Sunday, March 26th at 6 p.m. Uh, we'd love to have as many members here as we can couple of fun announcements here. We have two baby announcements. So uh, Micah Robert Thorne was born to Josh and Esther on February 21st, weighing in at eight pounds. A couple great photos up there. And then the second baby announcement, uh, Pascal Lori Howell was born to Mike and Nikki, uh, and that was on February 27th, and he weighed in at a whopping nine pounds, two ounces. So congratulations to them. We have come here this morning to worship a God who is worthy of our praise. So as I turn it over to the, the band here this morning, let's prepare our hearts to do just that. I'll invite you to stand for the call to worship this morning, which is taken from Psalm 99, the first five verses, which says, The Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim, let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The king in his might loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. And do just that, singing all creatures of our God and king. of our God and King, lift up your voice with us sing, oh praise Him, hallelujah, thou burning sun with golden beam, thou silver moon with softer
praise their creator bless and worship him in humbleness oh praise him hallelujah praise praise the father praise the son and praise the spirit three in one oh We are going to celebrate the Lord's table this morning here at West London Alliance Church. We practice what we call open communion. When we say open communion, we mean that the Lord's table is open to all those who have come to faith in Jesus Christ. And so if that's you this morning, we would invite you to celebrate with us. You don't have to be a member here. You don't have to be a regular here. If you are a follower of Christ, if you have availed yourself of his work of redemption through faith and repentance, please celebrate with us. If you're here this morning and you're not a believer, we would ask you to participate, but to participate in a different way. We would ask you to participate through observation and through contemplation. We encourage you to watch and to listen and to hear what's being said, to hear the prayers, and to watch the actions. We would ask you to not participate by taking the emblems. And as you observe and contemplate what Christ has done as we celebrate it, we would also ask that you contemplate and consider availing yourself of his work of redemption. We're going to take a moment of silence to prepare our hearts, following which I will pray a prayer of access. Merciful Lord, we do not presume 
to come to your table trusting in our own righteousness. Rather, we trust this morning in your abundant and great mercies. We acknowledge that we are not worthy even to gather up the crumbs under your table. And yet, you are the Lord who delights to show mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, to eat this bread and drink this cup, that our bodies and souls may be made clean by Christ's body and blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. You should have received the emblems as you came in one of the doorways. If there's anyone who hasn't received that, who's going to celebrate communion with us, you could just raise your hand and the ushers are prepared to uh, bring you an emblem. Uh, There's one in the middle down here. That's all right. And one over there as well. Jim, down here. If you could just raise, there you are. Uh, If you've never used these before, there's a clear film on top that you peel back to access the bread and a uh, pink foil a film to pull back when we take the cup. Let's go to the Lord in thanksgiving now. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you that in your tender mercy you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption. We thank you that he made there a full atonement for the sins of the world, offering once for all his one sacrifice of himself. And we thank you that he instituted and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until he comes again. And so we do this morning. Amen. And the same night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and gave God thanks. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for you, preserve your body and soul unto everlasting life. Take this and eat it in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave God thanks. And he gave it to the disciples, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you, preserve your body and soul unto everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you, And be thankful. Almighty and everlasting God, we thank you this morning with our whole hearts, for you have graciously given us the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we thank you that in that there is assurance, and you assure us of your favor and your goodness towards us. And you assure us that we are members in the body of your Son, which is the blessed company of all faithful people. And you assure us that we are also heirs through hope of your everlasting kingdom by the merits of Christ's most precious death. We humbly ask you, O Heavenly Father, to assist us with your grace, that we may continue in that holy fellowship and do all such good works as you have prepared for us to walk in. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. I'll invite you to stand and we'll sing a song that reminds us of our need for Christ. We'll sing, Lord, I need you. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart, 
You're my hope and stay. So teach my song to rise to you. The next part of our service is a testimony uh, from Rand Luca, who's one of the elders at Westland Alliance Church and also is a leader in the Arabic Fellowship and their main preacher. Uh, he shared with me a testimony of a powerful work of God that he was familiar with. And in hearing that, I thought this would be good for our congregation to hear. Further to that, uh, part of that testimony pertains to the earthquake that happened in the Middle East, a, a tragic catastrophe that uh, tens of thousands of people died in. And so I thought it was a, a current and powerful testimony for him to share. And so I'm going to ask Rand to come up and share that with you as part of our service this morning. Immediately following Rand's testimony, I'll ask uh, one of our elders, Brian Ward, to come and lead us to the Lord in prayer. Um, so, at the Arabic Fellowship, we uh, live stream our service every Sunday morning on Facebook. And uh, once in a while, we receive uh, requests from random individuals asking us to sponsor them to come to Canada. 
And uh, our answer to them is that, uh, very politely and graciously, we cannot do that, but there is something else we can do is that we can tell you about the life in Jesus Christ. I call it the uh, Peter and John approach. We don't have silver or gold, but uh, what we have we can give you, which is the Lord Jesus. So uh, over two years ago, a Muslim lady from Syria said, yes, my family and I are interested. We love, we heard about Jesus. We love him and we want to hear more about him. So we start to do weekly uh, meetings on uh, video chat on WhatsApp and uh, we start to do discipleship and open God's word and share with them on a weekly basis for over a year. Eventually, this family of husband and wife and two kids uh, at that time, 16 and 12, um, they confessed the Lord Jesus as Lord and Savior. Uh, they moved from their hometown eventually in Kamishli and uh, moved to Latakia to stay away from their family due to danger if they found out about their new faith. Um, one of the elders at a church in uh, uh, Latakia, so this is a church we knew through one of our congregants, Rommel, who introduced us to them so that we can connect this family to them. One of the elders, his name is Samer, took them over as one of his own, treat them like family, and start to disciple them and encourage them. And uh, about a year and a half later, um, the church granted them baptism, membership, and access to the Lord's table. And um, they were growing in their faith um, in, in an amazing way. The whole family have been very faithful to the Lord, willing to serve, and uh, um, have an evident love to God and to study his word and grow in it. They even evangelized the wife's um, brother, uh, and he came to faith through them. So it became the five of them. That's like their little secret. And uh, they all joined the church there and started to grow in their faith. Um, their life changed in an amazing way. Um, like when I meet with them, they are confessing their sins in front of each other and in front of me. And they showed love to God's word and willing to grow in it. And um, God has done miraculous things in their lives. So like uh, Pastor Jude was saying the other day, uh, Syria and Turkey was hit by a catastrophic earthquake. That resulted in more than 20,000 dead and uh, many more injured. Hundreds of thousands uh, lost their houses and possessions. Uh, we were praying for this family, praying for their church. I, I started to worry as I haven't heard from them during that time. And then one day, um, I, I saw her posting on Facebook Psalm 46, which reads those words, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear Though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. I, I was very encouraged. I was very comforted to see that. A few days later, I woke up to a message from, from the lady. Her name is May Soon, if you want to pray for her. Um, I woke up to a message from her in the morning, and this is what the message said, uh, I, and I quote, Good morning, Brother Rand. I'd like to thank the Lord for giving us the opportunity to get to know you, your family, and your church. It's not only that you are good people, but God has used you to, to deliver the message of salvation to us. After the earthquake, I thank the Lord Jesus that he has placed his hand over our family that not even one hair fell off of our heads. I'm grateful to our mighty Lord that each day is a more powerful testimony than the day before. It is as if he is saying to me that I didn't choose you to abandon you. Three days after things have settled down and after the earthquake, uh, Brother Samer, which is the elder, is taking us with him and another group from the church to visit families at the shelters. And I thank God for his children. The feeling of love to others is overwhelming. I'm grateful that God has provided for us during this difficult time, but I'm especially thankful that I became one of God's children. After I was fearful and timid, I started to grow um, in, sorry. After I was fearful and timid, I started to grow in God's word and grow in courage in speaking about the Lord and, and serving others. More than half of Latakia has been in ruins after the quake. The buildings around our house has fallen down like cardboard and ours, even though the bigger the bigger one didn't even lose a stone. How great is our God? 
I just wanted to thank you for being a part of our lives and share with you how overwhelming when we visit people, give them food and money, they start crying, and most important, they agree that we pray with them. And there are many people who gave their life to Jesus. I would never have imagined that I would have the courage to evangelize to others. Father God, how great you are and how wonderful is your word, end quote. It was very humbling for me personally to see how God works in people's life, new believers like, like this family, with their situation, how they trust God and, uh, and they, they cling to his word. Uh, it, it's amazing for me, and especially amazing that the church they, they are part of now, they receive monetary help from churches and use that help to bless the needy uh, and, and the circumstances, but in their faithfulness, they tell people that this is the hand of God and, this in, and use this initiative to share the gospel and to pray with people. So this was very encouraging to me, and I thought I would share it with our church to encourage our church as well. Thank you. Good morning, church. Um, this morning, before I knew Rand was going to speak, um, God's been laying on my heart a passage that uh, perfectly works with, uh, with what he was sharing and uh, what I was going to share with prayer. And it's Revelation uh, 3, 19 and 20. Um, and just a portion of that says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. And I understood the truth of that through the stories that Rand shared about the saving work, the, um, the baptism of the Holy Spirit that God would provide. Um, that's made very evident through that story, and thank you. Um, but it also applies to us because that verse, as I'm rereading it again, realized that it was written to the church in Laodicea. So it's written to us as Christians that, we can be baptized by the Holy Spirit, but we can go through life not dining with Christ, not inviting him into our hearts. And I think if we look in each of our hearts, we'll find areas where we don't meet with God. We uh, don't invite him in. And so this morning, what I'd like you to do as we go to prayer is that we take time to think of those areas of our life, those regions in our heart where we protect them from God. We don't offer them up to God. And in the same way God can save people from their sins, God can choose now to uh, or meet us. He has already chosen to do so. We just need to let him do so to have him meet with us and sanctify us from our sins. And so I would just ask that we do that as we go to prayer. Think of the things you think about as you came to church, the things you were thinking about while you're sitting in your pews, even before Rand spoke. Think of the things that distract you from just the presence of God in your life, and we're going to give those over to him and ask him to meet with us in a real way this morning. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the chance to see you work in our world. Lord, we thank you for the blessing this morning of hearing about Rand's work overseas through social media, which has been used in a way to meet with Masoon and her family. We thank you for the chance to see your um, presence made known to them, a relationship with you to be made real to them. And Lord, as they are able to focus on the blessings that you provide through safety and, and uh, just circumstantial uh, blessings, Lord, we also see that they are now blessed with the presence of you in their lives. We pray for that to continue and we lift them up. We thank you for the opportunities you've given Rand for the um, uh, his choice to uh, follow you in that and to reach out. And Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would just work through that situation to continue to play um, a role in saving and sanctifying lives across the world from us. And in the same way, Lord, we'd like to lift up the Boris. We thank you for Marcel and Kelly and for their sons, Ethan, Avro, and Silas. We just pray for their work overseas, for the continued opportunities that you would provide them, give them the energy, even as they have a young family, to be able to continue to reach out in Angola and to show love to those who uh, um, can uh, hear your word 
And we pray, Lord, that you would uh, help to uh, just reach out into those communities, again, across the world from us, that your word would, uh, would just reach out in ways unknown to us, Lord, but uh, to be made real and testimony back to us as we see uh, your promises come true. Lord, we also pray for you in our community. We lift up Compass Community Church and Pastor Joey Mudd. Lord, we lift up uh, their requests, um, that we lift them up in prayer, uh, that they would grow in their love uh, of you and confidence in your word, that you would empower them, Lord, to uh, help one another to follow Christ, and that you would embolden them to point their world, our world, back to you. And Lord, we pray as we partner with them in uh, the work in London, that you would strengthen them as uh, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. That, again, that our community would increasingly be changed in a way, Lord, that would see a commitment to you that would uh, uh, just both encourage uh, us, but more importantly, save uh, lives in and around us. And Lord, we lift up our church family for each of us. And as we take a moment, Lord, we understand that a prayer is not about the words we speak to you, but about the truths you speak to us and into our hearts. Lord, at this time, I'd just like to ask uh, that each of us take a moment that we would lay our finances at your feet. Lay our relationships at your feet. Lay family concerns, considerations, even joys at your feet. Job successes and failures, Lord, we leave them at your feet. Our plans, what we plan to do with our lives, Lord, we leave them with you. And our aspirations, Lord, we pray that we would want give those back to you. Lord, we pray that we would leave everything at your feet and that we would stop holding on to the things that we would hope would give us the promises that you already lay out in your scripture are wrapped up in your presence in our lives. And that we would stop worshiping the created and that we would focus once again on worshiping the creator. Lord, we just would ask that you give us more of yourself, that we might receive the fruit of the spirit you've already promised. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Lord, you've promised that when we pray in faith, you will give us those things. Please help us not to follow the lie that to think that if you order the events around us, the circumstances we live in, that somehow we will find those things. You don't take us, you don't promise to take problems from us. You give us guided tours through them, that through the presence of your Holy Spirit, Lord, we no longer have any problems that need to dominate us. And we pray for that. The Lord bless us. The Lord keep us. The Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. The Lord lift up his countenance upon us and give us peace. Both today and forevermore, Lord, we thank you. Amen. One of the changes in our service since COVID is we no longer take up tithes and offerings during the course of the service. Uh, many, most of you would know that. Uh, if you did bring something to put in the offering, there is a box at the back of the sanctuary. It's on the right-hand side as you leave. You can put, uh, deposit your offering in there and it will get taken care of. Another change in our services, which we used to do regularly before COVID, was take up special offerings. And uh, we want to start doing that again. And Rand and myself are uh, trying to figure out a way to get money to this Muslim family who has converted to Christ, was moved to Syria, and is now ministering and sharing the gospel with the victims of the earthquake. And so we will keep you posted on that. Uh, we're working on a way to do that, but that's something we would like to return to, and I wanted to give you the heads up for that. So we'll keep you posted and let you know how that might happen. 
Uh, I'm going to ask Jake Ward to come up for the public reading of God's word. It's my honor to uh, read God's word to you this morning. If you could open up to Hebrews 12, verses 4 through 17, that's where uh, reading is from. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. This is the word of the Lord. Well, we continue on in our sermon series through the book of Hebrews, focusing on Hebrews 12, 4 through 13 this morning. My sermon is entitled, Suffering as Sons. Now, the the idea of sonship in the Bible is is a rich theme. There's varied aspects throughout Scripture in regards to sonship. The expression son of God can refer to many different things in God's Word. In the book of Job, the angels are called sons of God. And in Exodus chapter 4, verse 22 and 23, son refers to all of Israel. Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. The term son of God can refer to a specific Israelite. And the king of Israel was the son of God par excellence, of whom God said, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Now, supremely, Jesus is the Son of God, and I'm sure you're aware of that. But I wonder if you're aware this morning of the fact that all believers are sons of God. That is, both men and women are sons, and both men and women are referred to as sons so that they might understand that the privileges of sonship belong to all believers. The Apostle Paul makes this clear in his letter to the Romans, where he declares that all believers have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Paul writes even more succinctly and explicitly in Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, where he writes, In Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God, through faith. 
for male and female Christians to be referred to as sons of God is purposeful. The writers of Scripture do that with intent. They could say it otherwise, and sometimes they do. For example, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, Paul makes reference to the people of God as sons and daughters of the Lord Almighty. But sometimes believers, both male and female, are referred to simply as sons. So what is it for all believers, both men and women, to be sons of God? Well, in ancient cultures, only sons were legal direct heirs of a family. And when an author refers to both men and women believers as sons, he's reminding all believers of their status, their status as those who receive the inheritance. Women and men as followers of Christ are equally privileged and equally valued as co-heirs of a full inheritance in Christ. Now, as the author of Hebrews continues to encourage God's people to endure, he does so leveraging their positions, their position as sons of God, speaking to both men and women believers in a way that's intended to stimulate and strengthen them so that they can endure in suffering. Let's keep that biblical view of sonship in mind as I read the passage again this morning. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 4 through 13. In your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. The main idea from this passage is that endurance, and enduring specifically in hardships and suffering, is encouraged by and accomplished through a biblical perspective of suffering. Now, as we locate ourselves in the text, remember that in chapter 10, verses 19 through 25, we were admonished to hold on to our faith, to endure. And then in chapter 10, verse 26 through 31, we were warned not to fall away. We must endure. And in 10, 32 through 39, we are exhorted to remain confident and to endure until the end so that we might receive final salvation. The heroes of faith in chapter 11 illustrate persevering faith, endurance, and faith that leads to final salvation because they believed in God's promises, believing in the midst of their own suffering that what he had promised would come to pass. In 12 verses 1 and 3, Jesus is, is presented as the supreme exemplar of faith, and we are reminded that the race must be run with endurance until the end. So with this idea of enduring faithfully in our minds, let's focus in on enduring through suffering. And that's where we start this morning. Point number one, their suffering, verses four through eight. The author endeavors to encourage the readers by describing to them a biblical perspective of their suffering. The author conveys this biblical view of suffering first with a gentle rebuke, and then with Scripture's testimony 
and then with God's perspective of them, and finally with a description of endurance. Let's begin with a gentle rebuke. The author wrote, In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Now, commentators agree that in line with what the author of Hebrews is arguing in this section of the book, this struggle against sin points to this struggle to endure in the midst of suffering. The struggle against sin is an internal struggle, and certainly apostasy is in view, the sin of apostasy, and yet all sin that they might commit is in view. But the struggle against sin is also external, in that they have been sinned against by those who persecuted them and caused their suffering. And so the suffering in view here is a result of sin. It's a struggle with sin, the sin of themselves, the sin of others, and the reality of living in a sinful, fallen world. Now, the author has already acknowledged that these people have suffered a great deal, Hebrews 10, 32 through 34. But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. However, they are reminded now that they have not suffered as much as some of God's faithful. Some of them we read about in chapter 11. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with the sword. They haven't suffered like that, not yet. Nor have they suffered like Jesus, who entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. Now, their suffering is significant, but there are worse cases. The question is, will they endure lesser suffering? Now, the author obviously raises this idea to encourage them to endure. And that's part of the point of chapter 11. These people could do it, so can you. Some of them have done it through worse conditions, and so you can do it through this one. The author then draws their attention to Scripture's testimony in regards to suffering. Specifically, he quotes Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. The community must remember that God regards them as children, as those who are sons, as those who are entitled to all the benefits and all the privileges of sonship. That's the testimony of Scripture. And further, the testimony of Scripture is that suffering for the child of God is fatherly discipline. Divine discipline and sonship go hand in hand. There's a close connection between being God's sons and suffering. Now, as we consider this encouragement to endure through the testimony of Scripture, can we just pause for a minute? Can we consider this connection between suffering and sonship generally? Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. A lot of months ago we considered that. It says, For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. As we consider our own status as sons of God, and as we consider our own suffering... Let's not forget that it was the suffering of the Son of God that saved us. It was the suffering of the Son of God which gave us access to God. And it was the suffering of the Son of God which brought many of us to glory as sons. You see, our suffering is not salvific, but His suffering was. Jesus and His substitutionary death 
absorb the punishment for sin that we deserve. He suffered for our sins. And we are brought to glory as sons of God when we acknowledge that our sins were the cause of his suffering. When we believe in him and believe in his death and resurrection. And when we entrust ourselves to him and his suffering on our behalf. You may be here this morning or listening online and you are not a believer. And you may be very interested this morning in what the Bible says about suffering and hardship. It's a very common question of unbelievers. What is the deal with suffering? And it seems that one of the ways that God reaches us in our unbelief is through suffering. Famous author C.S. Lewis wrote that God whispers to us, in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Perhaps your suffering or the suffering of someone you love has got your attention and you want to know what God says about suffering. Well, understand this this morning, the most important thing that God says about suffering in all of his revelation is that the suffering of his son, Jesus Christ, is the only means of salvation. It is only in the name of Jesus we are saved, and it's only by the blood of Jesus that we are saved. Could I suggest to you this morning That even before you deal with your own suffering or the suffering of someone you love and what the Bible says about that, that first you deal with the suffering of Jesus, the Son of God. We're going to talk more this morning about suffering and the sons of God, the suffering in believers. But I encourage you, become a child of God by putting your faith in God's Son, Jesus Christ. And availing yourself of his salvation that he won in his suffering. Now returning to scripture's testimony, we see from the author's quoting of Proverbs that God sees believers as sons and daughters entitled to the blessing of sonship. That is scripture's testimony of those who suffer. Well, what about God's perspective? What's God's perspective of them and their suffering? Well, God's perspective on the suffering of his children becomes a full frontal assault against our predisposition to see suffering as God's punitive actions against us. Don't we often see our suffering as us being punished? That's how we're inclined to believe when we suffer. For the sons of God, For those who have come to God through Jesus, suffering is not a punishment. It is discipline. The hardships, the trials, and the suffering of the recipients of the letter to the Hebrews are in actuality, according to the author, and thus according to God, are discipline. They're the loving discipline of the Heavenly Father for all those that he has received as sons. And these hardships, these trials, this suffering, it's evidence of God's fatherly care of them. That's God's perspective. Now this this is not a truth that is easy for us to reconcile. And this is especially difficult to see when we're in the midst of suffering. Can I admonish all of God's children? In the sound of my voice, could I admonish all of you who are not currently suffering, who are not currently suffering, at least in significant ways, to settle this question now? You need to address this question and you need to answer it, and it needs to be settled. And it needs to be settled before the onslaught of oppression, before the assault of affliction. Because in the heat of battle, in the, in the midst of the flames, in the center of the turmoil, this truth is much harder to accept 
And it's much harder to lean into it. We need to settle it now. If I am a child of God, if I am a son of God, my suffering is God's loving, fatherly discipline. And it gives me evidence of my acceptance in the Beloved. But Pastor Jude, it doesn't feel like love. Well, it is, and you need to settle it now. Pastor Jude, it doesn't feel like the actions of a good, good father. Well, it is, according to Scripture, so settle this question now. Pastor Jude, it it seems more like rejection. It can't be acceptance, can it? Yes, it can, and it is. Settle this now. Brothers and sisters, when the diagnosis of cancer comes, when the brutal advance of dementia sets in, when the realization of your spouse's infidelity comes to light, when the calls from the creditors become frequent, in that moment, getting the biblical godly perspective is going to be much, much harder. So let's settle this in our hearts now. My suffering as a follower of Christ is God's loving fatherly discipline, and it points to my acceptance with him. Now, if you are in the midst of suffering and you haven't settled this in your heart, you have a more difficult task ahead of you, but all is not lost. You aren't working through this alone. You have the Holy Spirit within you to help you to understand and to believe and to apply God's word to your soul, even in the midst of whatever chaos life has thrown at you. You can, in the midst of your suffering, acknowledge that you need God's help to understand this. You should pray that he would help you to understand and receive this truth. And then trust him. Trust him that this is a promise from him to you, despite the difficulty, despite the suffering. Trust this as to be God's fatherly discipline. And trust whatever it is you're going through to be evidence of his love and acceptance of you. The last perspective of suffering the author wishes to convey in order to help the reader endure pertains to a further understanding of endurance. What is endurance? Well, endurance is how the sons of God, both men and women, respond to suffering. Endurance is how God's sons navigate God's discipline. We read it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, and you are illegitimate children and not sons. Endurance is how sons of God respond to suffering. And they respond that way because it is his fatherly discipline in their lives. To not respond with endurance would be to deny your sonship. It would be to identify yourself as an illegitimate child. Those who have no status who receive no privileges and no benefits of sonship, they do not endure. This is God's perspective of a believer's suffering. Now, as the author puts forward a biblical view of suffering, part of that picture pertains to God. Point one was a biblical view of a believer's suffering. Point two is a biblical view of God in the midst of suffering. Point number two, their God, verse nine. The author now endeavors to encourage the readers to endure by insisting they have a biblical perspective of their God. Number nine, or sorry, verse nine. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject of the Father of spirits and live? Now, in our day and in our age, I think this statement 
might generate much more frustration and confusion than ever. You see, those who perceive their fathers as good and godly, those who respected them and respect how their fathers raised them, they can work out this analogy fairly easily. They look to that father who disciplined them in a godly way, and they give him in their minds and in their hearts a certain amount of respect and a certain amount of honor. And they understand that the sovereign God of the universe is perfect in holiness. And they understand that he has been discipling them in a loving, fatherly way. And so they can see their own earthly fathers whom they respected and honored. And then they can look to the Father of spirits, the Almighty Lord of all, and understand that he is worthy of so much more respect and honor. And that's the biblical perspective of God that the author of Hebrews is giving us, that we must respect him and honor him. For them, this might not be difficult, but this analogy is much more difficult for those of you who do not and did not respect your father. And perhaps your father abandoned you or abused you or neglected you. If that's the case, then respect might be the last impression you would have towards your father. And so how do you gain this perspective that the author is encouraging? How do you gain this perspective that will help you endure? I hope you want to have it, but how can you get there? Well, for those of you who had or have a difficult relationship with your father if he wasn't a good and godly father, you can still get there by recognizing that God is not like your father by contrast. God the Father is perfect in every way. And so you can leverage this analogy in Hebrews by speaking to yourself this way. Even though I did not respect and find it hard to respect my father because of his sinful ways against me, I know God the Father is not like that. He is perfect in every way. Though I may not respect or though I struggle to respect my own father, I can and should respect God because even in my difficulties, I can see that he is loving me and affirming my sonship in Christ. You can speak to yourself that way. You can learn from this analogy as well. A proper perspective of God as one infinitely worthy of our respect is necessary for a proper perspective of suffering, which we need in order to endure. And so with a biblical perspective of suffering and a biblical perspective of God, believers can move to a biblical perspective of the outcome of their discipline. That's point number three, verses 10 and 11, their discipline. The author now endeavors to help the readers to endure by insisting that they adopt a biblical perspective of the outcome of God's discipline in their life. We read in 10 and 11, for they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Here is what we need to understand about God's discipline, which we often experience as suffering and hardship. One, it is for our good. Two, through it we share in God's holiness. And three, it yields peaceful fruit of righteousness. One of the ways we talk about the good associated with suffering comes from the well-known and often quoted verses from Romans where Paul speaks about suffering, saying, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And a little further on in that chapter, as many of you know, Paul says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. 
And to that comforting verse, I say amen and amen. But the author of Hebrews takes this a little further. He isn't just suggesting that God will work in suffering for good. He is saying our suffering is for our good. That's a little bit farther, isn't it? These hardships, the, this suffering is working together for good, and they are for my good. Now, that's a crucial belief. My suffering is working together for good. My suffering is for my good. Even saying that and considering the reality of it is a bit difficult. It's one thing to say, God is working my cancer for good. It's another to say, my cancer is for my good. It's a bit more specific. It's a little bit raw. And it leaves a little less wiggle room. My unemployment is working for good. My unemployment is working for my good. Can you feel the difference? There's a different weight to those two declarations, and it's not easy. And yet, this is the godly biblical perspective. And we need to conform ourselves to this truth. Before I move on, let, let me be clear about what I'm not saying. I am not saying, and I do not believe the Bible says, that the thing that causes the suffering is good. Cancer isn't good. Death isn't good. Dementia isn't good. Depression isn't good. I haven't said that. The Bible doesn't say that. But God works our suffering for good, and he works it for my good. And yet the thing that causes it isn't necessarily good. I've got to speed up here. The next facet of a biblical perspective of the outcome of God's discipline is that we share in his holiness. Sharing in God's holiness through his good discipline is an already not yet concept. Already in each moment of our lives, the discipline of the Lord is meant to transform us now as we are sanctified in our daily walk with the Lord. And through our growth in godliness, through our being conformed to the image of Christ, through our beholding the glory of the Lord and being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, we are sharing in his holiness. However, there is a future not yet experience, an aspect to this holiness. We see both of these in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, uh, for, to you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit. All right, so that's the daily experience of his holiness and belief in truth. To this he has called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our daily sanctification now leads to the obtaining of the full glory of the Lord Jesus Christ at his return. And don't miss in there, we don't have time for it today, but don't miss that it is by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit works this in our lives. Our hardships and suffering is our Heavenly Father's good discipline. And that's the means that the Holy Spirit uses that we might share in God's holiness, now in part and completely when the Lord returns. Praise God that we have this helper, the Holy Spirit, to help us in regards to that. Now the final outcome is a harvest that this discipline results in. The author finishes off these thoughts on a proper perspective of suffering, which is God's discipline, with two metaphors, and one of them is agricultural. If we focus on this agricultural language, we see that the discipline of the Lord, whereby we share in God's holiness, will produce a harvest of righteousness. Now, I remember visiting my dad in Montana one year when I was much long, younger. 
And I remember being with my brother in the truck, and we were driving out in the country. We were driving along a cornfield. It was the end of the summer. The corn stalks were very high. You could see the ears of corn on the stalks quite easily. Up ahead, there looked like what was an abandoned bicycle lying on the side of the road. And as we got close to the bicycle, we noticed one of the most redneck guys we had ever seen. His hair was crazy. His beard was crazy. He had no shirt on. He had denim over and overalls. And he had a trucker hat. And he was coming out of the cornfield. And as he came out, we saw that the bib portion of his overalls was crammed full of corn. He was stealing corn. And as he came out of the field, he looked at us with this big grin on his face, and he said, this is the best corn in the whole state of Montana. Well, I guess that apparently means you can help yourself to it. Now, when I saw this phrase, harvest of righteousness, it made me think of that redneck's harvest of corn and how similar our harvest of righteousness is to that. We share in the righteousness of Christ. And we share it in our justification, which means that God, when we come to faith in him, declares us righteous with the righteousness of Christ. And we've also noticed that we are becoming more righteous through the indwelling and empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And just like that redneck corn stealer, we don't deserve the harvest of righteousness on either count. You see, if you think about that redneck, the corn seed wasn't bought by him, nor was it planted by him. The weeds weren't sprayed by him, nor was the field irrigated by him. The insects weren't thwarted by him. It was all the farmer's doing. And he walks into the cornfield to get the best corn in Montana, and he fills his bib with it. Well, brothers and sisters, our harvest of righteousness is all of grace. We may work in our progressive sanctification, but the Spirit does the heavy lifting. And the crop of righteousness which we endure, this harvest of righteousness, was bought and paid for by Christ through his severing. Christ's work made it available to us. And it is the best righteousness, the only righteousness in the world. And praise God, we get to fill our bibs with it. Our suffering and our hardships are the loving discipline of a heavenly Father. And His discipline is for our good. And through it, we share in God's holiness, and it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. And that is something to rejoice in even in the midst of suffering. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you this morning for the work of Christ. And we thank you, Father God, that in the midst of our suffering, your word indicates that we suffer as sons. And therefore, our suffering is your discipline. Help us to understand that. Help us to see your discipline Discipline, sorry, our, our suffering is your discipline and evidence of your love towards us. And help us to have a biblical perspective of our suffering and, and what the outcome is. That by it we partake in your holiness. By it we receive this harvest of righteousness. And we didn't earn it. But we get it because of Christ. I pray you would help us in this. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, in response to that, I'll invite you to stand. We'll sing one song to close, uh, 10,000 Years. <laughs>
day dawning, it's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.